Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, so at the moment we're uh, in the process of introducing basic concepts associated with the G-protein coupled receptors. And now what we're talking about is the classification of the G-protein coupled receptors into the five families. Okay, and these are the rhodopsin family, the secretin family, the glutamate family, the adhesion family, and the frizzled taste to uh, family. Okay, so we're going to work through these families one by one, starting with the rhodopsin family. Okay, so rhodopsin family G protein coupled receptors. So basically they have quite small amino terminals. Okay, so we start off with the amino terminal and often it will be just drawn like this. Okay, so here is the amino terminal of our protein. Then we have our seven transmembrane domains. Okay, so here's transmembrane domain one. Let's practice our nomenclature. Here's the intracellular loop one. Here's the transmembrane domain two. Here's the extracellular loop one, the transmembrane domain three, the second intracellular loop, the transmembrane domain four, the fourth, sorry, the second extracellular loop, uh, transmembrane domain five, the third intracellular loop, transmembrane domain six, the third extracellular loop, and transmembrane domain uh, seven, and then the carboxyl terminus of the protein here. Okay, now what's very important about uh, rhodopsin family G protein coupled receptors is the position where the ligand binds, basically, because the ligand will bind to amino acid residues which are in the transmembrane domains. Okay, so the ligand will bind potentially here, it will bind two residues which are in the transmembrane domains. And by drawing it there, I don't mean to imply that it's specifically transmembrane domain 3 and transmembrane domain 4. Basically, it will bind to residues that are part of these transmembrane domains, or these membrane spanning alpha helices. So it binds in the transmembrane domain portion of the G protein coupled receptor. So this black dot then is meant to represent the ligand. Okay, right, so that's one of the significant things about this uh, rhodopsin family of G-protein coupled receptors, that the ligand will bind to residues within the transmembrane domains. Okay, uh, now let's talk about some examples of members of the rhodopsin family of G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, so uh, probably the most famous example would be the beta receptors, so the beta adrenoreceptors, so the beta 1 receptor, the beta 2 receptor, and the beta 3 receptor. Those are all members of this rhodopsin family of G-protein coupled receptors. Now, the other example I want to discuss, at least in this introductory video, is the example of rhodopsin itself. Now, rhodopsin is an unusual one, okay, because basically rhodopsin in its normal state has an inverse agonist bound to it. Okay, so rhodopsin is actually the name for the opsin, which is the G protein coupled receptor. So opsin is a seven transmembrane receptor just like this, okay, within the rhodopsin family of G protein coupled receptors. But usually what it has bound to it is another molecule which is an inverse agonist. And I'll explain what an inverse agonist is in a moment. And this other molecule is 11 cis retinal. Okay, so uh, you can imagine the 11 cis retinal bound uh, to residues within the transmembrane domain of the opsin G protein, okay, and together that combination of the opsin with the 11 cis retinal bound together, that is what is meant by rhodopsin. So rhodopsin is not actually just the G protein coupled receptor. The G protein coupled receptor is the opsin uh, with this special inverse agonist which is 11 cis retinal bound, then it's called rhodopsin. So I am calling 11 cis retinal uh, an inverse agonist, okay? So let's just have a revision of our basic pharmacology. So let's remind ourselves of what an agonist is, what an antagonist is, and what an inverse agonist is.
So, an agonist is just any molecule which binds to a receptor and activates it, okay? So it increases uh, the activity of the receptor. It increases the amount that the receptor is interacting with downstream pathways, okay? So agonist will activate the receptor. An antagonist is not something which inhibits the receptor. An antagonist is a molecule which will bind to a receptor and stop it from being activated. So it's a subtle difference. Antagonists do not inhibit receptors. They stop the activation of receptors. So they bind to the site. Uh, they bind to the same site as the agonist would bind. And basically they do nothing to the receptor. They don't stimulate it, but neither do they inhibit it. All they do is they stop the agonist then being able to bind and activate the receptor. So when you then throw agonists at the receptor, it won't be able to do anything because the antagonist will be bound there. Okay, so that's strictly speaking what is meant by an antagonist. An inverse agonist is a molecule which actually binds to the receptor and decreases its, its activity. It actually does inhibit the receptor. And you might say, well, what is there to inhibit? The receptor's only activated once the agonist binds. Well, the reality is and that all receptors will have a certain amount of activity even when they don't have the agonist bound. So uh, if you just have loads of receptors without agonist, okay, so let me draw this, let's just have some receptors here, so these are all receptors, then there will be a little bit of activity. The receptors will have some efficacy. They will interact with downstream pathways even when the ligand is not bound. But when an agonist binds, what will happen is the amount that the receptors interact with the downstream pathway will hugely increase. Now, an inverse agonist is something which binds to the receptor and takes the amount that the receptor interacts with the downstream pathway below what it would be if there was nothing bound to the receptor. So they really do inhibit the receptors. They stop the receptors having their basal level of interaction with the downstream pathway. They reduce that, okay? So agonists take the amount that the receptors interact with the downstream pathways up. Inverse agonists take the amount that the receptors interact with the downstream pathway down, okay? And antagonists just block uh, agonists from being able to bind. Right, so that's uh, what is meant by an inverse agonist. So an inverse agonist, basically the 11 cis retinol is bound to the opsin, and whilst it's bound to the opsin, the opsin cannot interact with G proteins, basically. It can't interact with heterotrimeric G proteins. Now, when light hits 11 cis retinol, it can be converted, so I'll put H nu to represent light coming in, it can be converted into something known as all trans retinol. So basically the double bond at position 11 goes from being in the cis conformation to being in the trans conformation. Okay, uh, and when the 11 cis retinol changes to all trans retinol, the all trans retinol no longer has this inverse agonist activity that the 11 cis retinol had. So now the opsin isn't inhibited anymore in the way that it was when the 11 cis retinol was bound. So what it can then do is it will increase the level uh, with which it interacts with the downstream signaling pathway. So it will now interact with heterotrimeric G proteins more than when it had the 11 cis retinol bound. So basically, in this case, you activate the receptor by destroying the inverse antagonist, sorry, the inverse agonist, and uh, stopping it from being able to inhibit the actual receptor. Okay, so that's a quite unusual example, basically. Uh, but that's rhodopsin, which is a member of this uh, rhodopsin family of G-protein coupled receptors. Let's go on to family 2 now, which contains the G... Well, uh, this is called the secretin family, and I'll tell you some examples in a moment. Uh, the secretin family of G-protein coupled receptors is significant because of the way that the ligands bind and also because of the nature of the ligands. So the ligands for secretin G-proteins um, coupled receptors, rather, secretin G-protein coupled receptors are generally peptides, okay? And let me draw a picture of where the ligands bind to these. So secretin G-protein coupled receptors 
have a larger amino terminus than uh, do the rhodopsin family G protein coupled receptors. Okay, so let me draw this out now. So let's have the amino terminus here. Okay, and basically let's have a little bit of a extracellular domain like so. Okay, and then we'll have the seven transmembrane domains here. So here are these seven membrane spanning alpha helices, and here's the carboxyl terminus down here. Now basically these peptide ligands for secreting family G protein coupled receptors, they bind in between the amino terminus, uh, amino terminal domain here, this extracellular domain, and uh, the seven transmembrane domains uh, here basically. So this is where the ligand binds in between these two different portions of the G protein coupled receptor. Now, uh, let me give you some examples of secreting G protein coupled receptors. So, for instance, the receptors that respond to calcitonin are uh, G protein coupled receptors within this secreting family. Okay, the um, G protein coupled receptors which respond to parathyroid hormone (PTH). Okay, so parathyroid hormone. Uh, they are also um, secreting family G protein coupled receptors. And another major example is the G protein coupled receptors which respond to glucagon, uh, which is the hormone which raises blood uh, glucose. Uh, this, um, these are also uh, of the secreting family of G protein coupled receptors. Okay, so there are some important examples. So the ligand for secreting family G protein coupled receptors is generally a peptide ligand, and it generally binds in this way between the transmembrane domain and this amino terminal domain here. Okay, so let's go on to family three. So this is the glutamate family of G protein coupled receptors. Okay, so this clearly contains the metabotropic glutamate receptors, the M-GLU-Rs for short, okay, which stands for metabotropic, that's the M. Okay, and remember metabotropic was another, well, metabotropic receptors was another name for G-protein coupled receptors. And the GLU is for glutamate, the most important excitatory uh, neurotransmitter within the brain. And then the R is for receptor. Okay, so there's a whole family of metabotropic glutamate receptors. Okay, another, uh, another example of um, glutamate family G protein coupled receptors are the GABA B family of receptors. Okay, so the main GABA receptors within the brain are GABA A receptors, which are uh, members of the cis loop ligand gated ion channel uh, family. Okay, but you also have GABA B receptors, which also respond to GABA, and of course, GABA is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter within the brain. So we've got glutamate and GABA, the two main neurotransmitters within the brain. Now let's have a look at the structure of these glutamate family G protein couple receptors. Basically, they have this kind of venous flytrap. Uh, structure in their amino terminal domain. Okay, so here's the amino terminus. Then I'll draw in the transmembrane domain here. So here are our seven membrane spanning alpha helices spanning the membrane. And basically, what's significant is that the ligand will bind between these two portions here. Okay, and this will sort of close in around the ligand and trap it in. So basically, you've got a venous flytrap. Uh, sort of structure here, basically. Okay, so that's what's significant about these glutamate receptors. Um, fam well, these sorry, these glutamate family G protein coupled receptors uh, ligand binding activity. Okay, so uh, now the final two families. So the fourth family is the adhesion family of G protein coupled receptors. Okay, now these G protein coupled receptors attach to the extracellular matrix. Okay, so they have very large uh, amino terminal domains which are going to interact with the extracellular matrix. Okay, so there is this very large amino terminal domain, and here is this transmembrane domain with seven membrane spanning alpha helices, like so. So I'll bring this up a bit. So here's the carboxylic acid group here. And here's the amino terminus here. And then this extracellular domain here will then interact with some extracellular matrix here. So this is the ECM or extra 
cellular matrix. So the E is for extra, the C is for cellular, and then the M is for matrix. Okay, so these adhesion um, family of G protein coupled receptors, these the members of this family will bind to extracellular matrix components. And now the final family of G protein coupled receptors, which is the frizzled slash taste 2 family. Okay, and this is named because of the two most famous examples of receptors within uh, this family of G protein coupled receptors. Okay, so um, significantly these have again a quite large amino terminal domain. Okay, like so. So here's the amino terminus, and here's the polypeptide uh, within the extracellular portion, and then they have the transmembrane domain, like so, with this characteristic seven transmembrane uh, alpha helices here. Okay, and the ligand for these receptors in this family will bind to this extracellular portion here. So this is where the ligand will bind. Now, for the two main examples of this family, we have the frizzled receptor and also the taste 2 receptor. The ligand for frizzled receptors is wint, and the ligand for the taste 2 receptors is bitter tasting molecules, basically. Okay, so that now concludes our uh, general introduction to G-protein coupled receptors. In the next video, what we'll do is move on to discuss heterotrimeric G-proteins.